It was like you looked through the veil and you saw something at work that was so vast and so almost impersonal or so the compassion was such horrible compassion. And for us to be able to live in that world where our hearts are breaking because from a human point of view, the suffering is unbearable, though you can bear it. And you can bear it because you are balanced with that other level of awareness, which understands that it is as it is. And I'll tell you from where I'm looking, there are no errors in the game. There were no mistakes. It is absolutely unfolding just right. And that where you are at this moment is not an error. Welcome to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. I'm Jackie Dobrinska, the Director of Education, Outreach, and Inclusion for Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. And you all, you are the Ram Dass community. It's really nice to be together through time and space to hear these teachings. And we have a really lovely and poignant episode for you today. In this talk from 1987, Ram Dass explores how everything is perfect from one point of view. And from another perspective, the pain and suffering is unbearable. He also talks about learning to make his life, his yoga practice, and how to love all of the faces of the beloved. I think it's one that will deeply touch many of us. But actually, we'd like to hear from you. If this podcast resonates and you want to discuss your insights and your curiosities and those aha moments with others, or you just want to have a community to talk about these things that you might not talk about with other people, please join the Ram Das Fellowship Meetup. The next one is Tuesday, September 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll be talking about this podcast. All you have to do is sign up at ramdas.org slash fellowship, and then you'll get all the information in your inbox. You know, Ram Das's teachings stand on the shoulders of his guru, Maharaji. And if you want to know more about how Maharaji has touched people since his passing, I encourage you to check out Whisper in the Heart. It's, you can, it's right here. You can find it wherever books are sold. You can also buy it by going to shop.ramdas.org. And if you're on that page, you'll also see the Be Here Now fundraiser that's happening supports this network so that we can put out these 20 plus podcasts each week and month. If you do donate, you will be entered into a lovely drawing with lots of prizes, including a chance to win a spot at the Ramdas Maui retreat in December. So make sure you check that out. And it wasn't just Maharaji who helped Ramdas awaken to all of these truths. It was also the devotees who helped the Westerners on their journey. And one of those people is K.C. Tuari. Krishnadas talks about him a lot. And you can learn more about this amazing man and yogi in a new film that we're putting out called Brilliant Disguise. It's debuting in L.A. and Santa Fe on September 30th. But there'll be additional dates of ongoing screenings, and you can find those at ramdas.org slash brilliantdisguise. So these are just some of the ways to sort of deepen into the teachings and deepen into this community and satsang, which is what Ramdas hoped for the future. So with that, let us turn our attention to this incredible episode after a quick and important word from our sponsor. Thanks so much. Namaste. See, when you, when I, when I um, meditate and pull back from my identity as a separate entity, and I get right to the cusp between form and formless. My awareness is just hovering, if you will. And I'm looking out at the world of forms. It's a gestalt in which you see all the forms. It's like you're seeing the whole universe and you see how exquisitely lawful it all is. And you're blown away by the beauty of the law of it all. You can hardly breathe. It's so beautiful. 
I mean, you can see it happen when astronomers study astronomy, or geneticists study genetics, or chemists study chemistry, or physicists study physics, or, or musicians who really understand the structure of music. Wherever you do it, astrology, whatever it is, you can be blown away by the beauty of the lawful relationship of things in the universe. And there's a place when you stand back far enough. My guru used to say to me, Ramdas, don't you see it's all perfect? And I'd say to him, perfect, Maharaji? Perfect? What about Bangladesh? What about, what about Auschwitz? What about, I mean, what are you talking about perfect? And he goes, oh, don't you see it's all perfect? Meaning, can't you get to that plane where you can get out of your human predicament enough to see the way it all is, the lawful unfolding of it all, including the suffering, including all of it, that it's not an error, it's all just unfolding lawfully. And you see that, and it is so breathtaking. But you see what happens when you sit in that place, somebody falls down in front of you and you say, karma. You see it lacks a certain warmth, but then you come down into your human heart and the suffering you see is unbearable because your human heart can't handle it. There's battered, this women, battered children, there's whales that are being treated into extinction, there's seals, there's trees, there's persecution, there's amnesty stories, there's their work is blind and starving. All you got to do is look in the mirror, look at your family to see suffering. What is your, what's a poor human heart to do? What's a poor human heart to do? And what most of us do is we armor our hearts and we become what's called in the trade of the serving professions, professionally warm. We are caring and concerned and all, but we don't really let our hearts go wide open because we fear it would all break. And because we armor our hearts from the suffering, we at the same moment cut ourselves off from the life juice we need to be living spirit. Because the heart is like the umbilical cord into the spirit. I'm not talking now about the emotional heart. I'm not talking about the romantic heart. I'm talking about the quality of what the Chinese call the sin sin or the intuitive heart mind. It's that deeper quality of where awareness and compassion come together. What I, what's been happening to me is that I go up, I would see this perfection, I would see the beauty, I would be so appreciative then I would come down and I would feel the pain. And most of the time, I must admit that for years, I couldn't handle the pain. So I pushed it away and went up to hide. And I said, well, I'm doing my spiritual work, which because I couldn't look in the eye, the all of it in the eye. And then I saw that as long as there was something I was turning away from, I wouldn't be free. And if I'm not free, how can I free anybody else? And to turn around and look at death and look at pain and look at suffering and allow your heart to break and then see that with the broken heart, you're still here. That's the one that it gets interesting. That's the one where it gets interesting. It's the balancing of those two planes of consciousness where you're not standing anywhere. Last week, a fellow called me who I've known for a long time and he told me he had AIDS and he was in the hospital with pneumocystis, the pneumonia form. And he was completely freaked. And we cried together over the phone and my heart was breaking for him. I mean, he had gone to law school, his, all his models of his plans for life had just were collapsing right there. My heart was breaking for him. There was another part of me that was just here. Ah, well, now, new curriculum for this fellow. See, from the soul's point of view, he just went into the advanced training course. 
from the personality's point of view, it stinks. What he heard from me was empathy for his personality, because I'm a human. He felt my heart hurting for his heart hurting. But what he also heard was another part of me, which at first, I don't lay it on him, I'm just there. But because we've known each other for many years, as he quiets down, he lets himself come into that other space and he begins to see his own suffering and his own predicament as merely more of the curriculum, another opportunity for growth. That multiple level of perception, which you can't play, at first it's sequential. You go up and you come down, you go up and you come down. Then it becomes simultaneous after a while. It's just sort of all there all at once. I mean, I walk into the bank to cash a check and I look at the teller and there's a teller and there's a woman and there's the divine mother and there is God. Now, you learn what the appropriate response is. I mean, if you say, oh, divine mother, she presses the button, you know, I mean, you learn as you don't play. But if your mind isn't so busy, if you're only the cashier of a check, you will only see the teller. And that leads her, that your mind becomes that which keeps her imprisoned in tellerness. If your mind is spacious, it allows her to be who she needs to be at that moment. And maybe just that one second will be, just like the, with the Minister of Health, will be a moment where we just meet each other in space, recognize each other. Is it warm in here? Is there a way to open some doors and just get a little ear in on both ends just for a minute so we can cool down? Because I don't want to stop just yet. That's, yet I don't want you all to broil. I think maybe at that end too, if we can. Last year, my stepmother was um, dying of cancer and I had the opportunity to nurse her. And um, she was a, a, a tough lady. She was strong and she was a good lady, very good woman. And I really felt... Um, it was very hard for her, her ego, her dying. And um, she was young in her 60s, late 60s. And I, as my human heart, I liked her. And I would have done what I could to take away her suffering. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I had catheters and all those things and carrying her to the toilet and all the stuff. I'm making milkshakes just the way she might drink a little bit and things like that. But at the same moment, the pain went on. It didn't, it was relentless. And she kept saying to me, I don't understand this pain, Rich, which meant I've been a good person. Why am I having this pain? And I would hold her and I watched a phenomenon happen. <clears throat> this is a quote from Aeschylus from the Arrestia. In our sleep, pain, which we cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. To look at the world from back there where you see the way in which suffering burns through in people. I watched her go from being, I watched that pain beat her ego down. Now, one level, that is watching somebody being murdered by pain. And at the same moment, as the egg cracked, as the ego broke, I saw a spirit emerge. She was so radiant and so present and so clear. 
the last few days of her life, there was no more Phyllisness. There was this spiritual being. Her death was just a letting a breath go out and not taking another one in. And there was no way I had met those beings when I met my guru. I met, I know what that kind of a being is that's free, but there was no way I ever expected Phyllis to be that person. And when she got to that, I could only, it was like, it was like you looked through the veil and you saw something at work that was so vast and so almost impersonal or so the compassion was such horrible compassion. Can you hear that? It's Shiva, it's Shiva love, that I could barely look at it. And I had to admit that it was the awful grace that I had just seen. And for us to be able to live in that world where our hearts are breaking because from a human point of view, the suffering is unbearable, though you can bear it, and you can bear it because you are balanced with that other level of awareness which understands that it is as it is. And I'll tell you from where I'm looking, there are no errors in the game. There were no mistakes. It is absolutely unfolding just right. And that where you are at this moment is not an error. Most of us have this, well, I'm doing fine. If only, if only... I remember a woman coming up to me and saying, I'd really like to do my spiritual practices if it weren't for the kids. <laughs> Can you hear that the kids are the way? That the curriculum is horrendous. When I came back, I went to... I went to Burma a year before last to meditate. And when I was in Burma, uh, when you go in a monastery, this, this is Theravadan Buddhism, all you do is you follow the breath rising and falling in your abdomen. And you do that from three in the morning until 11 at night in your cell. That's it. You don't read and you don't write and you don't talk to people and you don't look at anybody. You see the teacher for five minutes a day. See, when you go in to report to the teacher, you go in and you bow and you say, I wish to report on my meditation I have been following the rising and falling of the breath, which he knows since he told you to do it, but you've still got to say that. And then you say, I notice the rising as rising. It had a quality of elasticity. You describe the quality, and then I noticed the fall. And, and I watched a report on something last evening. I had been, I sat down to meditate. After about two minutes, I became aware of the sound of a bird. I noted it as listening. He said, did you notice the bird on a rising or a falling breath? I didn't notice. Please do better in the future. <laughs> and as you're getting up to leave, excuse me, did you awaken this morning on a rising or falling breath? I didn't notice. All right, thank you. And you get really far out in that space because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> and you're just rising, falling. And your mind, I mean, my mind, I could have like, seven hours sexual fantasies uh, in that cell, you know, where are you now? And then I think I'm supposed to be looking at my breath. Oh, the hell with it. And I go back into, you know, I mean, I, when you're alone for two months, seven days a week, three to 11, and you're not eating because you only eat until noon. You don't eat till the next day. There's nothing to do. I mean, you talk about boredom. You really get to see boredom and you see that it's just another thing. And you watch your mind rising, falling, rising, falling, and then the thought comes like, this will never work. And usually your mind grabs and treats it as real because each thought goes, Psst, think me, I'm real, see? <laughs> and you grab it and you say, well, and if you, this will never work, yeah, this will never work, thank you very much, goodbye, and you leave Rangoon, see? But if you're trained, you just come back to rising, falling, rising, falling. You just see it's another thought. And then the next one comes, my knee hurts, and when is lunch, and all this stuff. And the one that always gets you is rising, falling. I think it's happening, honestly. And that's the spiritual materialist one that gets you. You know, like, my God, it's happening. Oh, yeah, right, it's happening. And then you forget the breath. So, um, I had this... 
This is going a little far out, but oh, what the hell? We'll, we'll do the advanced course. I uh, I had come into the meditation course. Actually, I cheated. See, I brought uh, a picture of my guru. I brought a hundred poems of Kabir, the Sufi poet, who's a great bhakti, a lover. And I brought two one-pound bags of M&Ms. <laughs> see, regular M&Ms and peanut M&Ms. See? <laughs> and each day, I would allow myself two regular M&Ms, two peanut M&Ms. I'd measure them out. I mean, I knew how many were in a bag. I bet you don't know. And... Uh, <laughs> And um, and uh, one poem, and uh, looking at the picture for a little while, and then the rest of the time I was a good Buddhist. <laughs> Funny thing happened about the second week. I started to hear. I woke up and I started to hear. Shri Shri Ram J Ram J J Ram 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 Now that's a, a mantra that I chanted for years back in the 60s and early 70s. I had long since not been chanting it. There it was, and the traffic was making that sound. I kept wondering, who's singing it? And then as I listened, it was the traffic, and it was the cows, and it was, thus the whole universe was Sri Ram, J Ram. And I thought, well, that is what I'm doing here. I'm supposed to be following my breath. So I try following my breath. I go breathing in, and then between the in-breath and the out-breath, I hear Sri Ram. <laughs> so, you know, and, I, and I started to pit myself against my, I mean, it was bizarre. I thought, well, at least I'm pretty holy if at least... The thing that's ruining one method is another spiritual method. I mean, at least it's better than, you know. And I went on for two weeks struggling with this thing. I mean, it was driving. I thought, this is psychosis because, you know, nobody was singing it but my mind. And every time between every in-breath and out-breath, I'd hear, sure, but, you know, and it was just there. You know, I knew it was waiting for me. You really get insane in a cell, I'll tell you, you know. Finally, I went to my teacher. I was hiding it from him, see, because I didn't really want him to know this. So uh, I went to him and he said, oh, uh, you've been to India? Yes. You've studied those kind, with those kind of sects? I said, yes. Ah. He said, would you take refuge in the Buddha and it will help? So I walked back and I thought, this is pretty bizarre. I'm going to use the Buddha to get rid of Ram, you know, which is, my name is Ram Das, means servant of Ram. I'm using a Buddhist technique to get rid of a Hindu, you know. So I came back to my room and I thought, well, look, I'm after truth. All these methods lead to truth. If, I, if my guru is who I think he is, he's truth. And if he's not, who needs him? And this method, if it's a good method, it should lead me to truth. And truth is truth. So I'll put away the picture and I'll put away the poems. I didn't put away the M&Ms because that was a different <laughs> level of the game. But... <laughs> The minute I put those away and just did the method, the singing ended, the chanting ended. And I went on. Now, the first month of the meditation, I kept dreaming that a telegram would come that would say, well, you are needed, you know, <laughs> that I could say, I really want to stay and do this practice, but I have to leave, you know. <laughs> By the second month, I decided I could stay the three months. I could manage it. At the end of the second month, the telegram came and it said that my stepmother had cancer and they needed me because my father was very old. Now, two things happened that I want to share with you. I came back to the States, and um, my stepmother and I decided we would hang in together through the whole process. Like, we'd submit to the doctors together, and we'd be together. I said, I'd just hang in with her. So at one point, she had had a sarcoma removed from her thigh, and there was a spot on her liver, and they didn't know whether it was malignant or not. And they'd done a needle biopsy, and we were going to get the results. And the doctor's office called, and she was on one phone, and I was on the other. And I was looking at a picture of my guru. And the nurse said, just a minute, the doctor's coming on the line. And this would mean, if it was in her liver, it meant it was systemic, and it would probably mean that she, it was all over her body, and she would die. 
And I said to my guru, I can't ask you for anything because you know how it all is and you know how it must be. But if it's all the same to you, you know, would you mind cleaning this one up for me? You know, the doctor came on the phone and he said, Mrs. Alper, I'm sorry to tell you it's malignant. It's the fastest growing cells. If we don't take it out in a week, you'll be dead. And so on. And I looked at the picture of my guru and my heart went like that, just grabbed clothes. And I said, you son of a bitch. And I felt this fury. And the next moment, I experienced love, the likes of which I had never felt before. It was like I had just been bathed. And what I heard was, and this too. It was like you just met another face of the beloved. If you can hear that. That most of us only want to see the smiling face of the beloved. And the Kali quality or the Shiva quality or the, the wrathful deity quality, we don't, we don't want to know anything about it. If you're going to embrace it all, you've got to be able to look at it all. As Kabir says, do what you do with another being, but never put them out of your heart. You've got to be able to look at all the forms in which God manifests and keep your heart open. It's like Mother Teresa picking up the lepers in the gutters of Calcutta. And she is picking up her beloved in all his distressing disguises. She's with her lover. You say, isn't she courageous? That's not courage. Boy, what a chance to be with your beloved. What I'm saying to you or trying to share with you is that what has been happening is that as I am less afraid to look at the humanity, to look at the whole ball of wax and to let my heart hurt and to let it all be out there and let my humanity be present, I'm feeling the balancing of these forces that there's just enough of that clearer, that, that kind of meta-consciousness to balance the, the humanness, to give the whole thing body that is the root of compassion, the way I understand it. Because compassion isn't just pity and compassion isn't just sucking somebody deeper into the melodrama, which is all death and sickness and suffering is, is, a, is an attachment of mind to a plane of reality in which a scenario is happening. Sure. When Ramana Maharshi was, I just don't want to block anybody's view. It's okay. No, it's fine. When Ramana Maharshi was, um, was dying and his devotees were crying, Bhagwan, don't leave us. Don't leave us. He said, don't be silly. Where could I go? Where could I go? I'm just dropping my body. It's like I'm just selling the Ford. It's no big deal. <laughs> But the feeling was somehow that, see, we have, there are certain things that catch us all the time. Death is one of them. Suffering is another one. We lose the balance. We get caught into one part of our heart and we lose the deeper part. And as we keep cultivating that balance, we get just like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a quality of isness that is so full of heart and so empty at the same moment. There is a line in Buddhism that says, out of emptiness arises compassion. It has that combination of the pain that I started talking about at the beginning of the lecture and the giggle. My guru's walking down a street and he's walking with an old friend and suddenly he starts to giggle. And the friend says, what are you giggling about? He says, so-and-so Ma, one of his old women devotees just died. He just knew it in his mind. And the man turned to him and said, you butcher, what are you laughing about if she just died? Maharaji turned to him and said, what do you want me to do, make believe I'm one of the puppets? And at the same moment, tears would pour down his cheeks at everybody's suffering. 
can you and I stretch to be fully who we are? To see the universe in that clear, dispassionate way and still be passionate? What does it mean to be involved in life without being attached? What does it mean to be so fully with each human being you meet that you are them, you're feeling all of it? You can't do it from your mind because your mind always keeps everybody at the distance of one thought away. Let me just share with you the other thing that happened when I came back from Burma. Somebody had to take care of my father. And so for a while, it was me. I only did it for a little while, for about several weeks. And then this beautiful fellow came along who's helping out that allows me to be here. Dad's 89 next week. <clears throat> the requirement for taking care of dad was that each morning I would get up, wake him, take his blood pressure, help him get his feet over the side of the bed, get him onto the walker, help him walk to the bathroom, take off his pajamas, sit on the toilet. He's had some minor shocks, no paralysis, but is just very quiet inside. Brush his bridge, help him get into the shower, soap his body, wash him, dry him, help dress him, sit him down, put on his socks and shoes, comb his hair, get him on the walker, walk into the kitchen, prepare breakfast, offer him breakfast, he eats breakfast, give him his insulin shot, prepare his pills, get him on the walker, walk into the den, get him in the chair, put a blanket over him. It takes about an hour and a half. Now, I had been in Burma, so I had gotten so acute at watching my own mind. You can imagine, I went right from the cell in Burma to the intensive care unit in Boston by jet. And then taking care of dad, I was keeping a diary at the time, the way my mind was working. And as I look back over that diary, I see a very interesting set of sequence, a sequence of events. I see that each day I would come up and I would have a different scenario in my head of what I thought I was doing. So one day I'd come up and the dominant theme in my mind was that I was the, sort of the good son taking care of dad who had come back from his spiritual practices to do this good thing. Yeah, that's who I was. Hi, Dad. And I was living out that scenario all through the whole sequence, all the way to the kitchen and back. Then another day, I notice in my diary that I am busy with other thoughts and plans and I need to make telephone calls and... I'm busy being irritated because dad's old and moves slow. And I'm saying things like, dad, could you move a little faster? And that's who I was that day. And then another day, I'm busy in my scientific mode. And I'm looking at dad as a set of ambulatory variables. Because when you get old, your intestine becomes fascinating. You know, you got to study what goes in and what comes out. And we have charts on the wall. So we make sure what goes in comes out. And there's blood pressure and blood sugar and all these things. I mean, and you become like Dr. Kildare, you know, when you're wearing a stethoscope and you're, it's really incredible when you take care of somebody that's very old. Then another day, I was somebody, a spiritual teacher helping father through transition. Dad, age is all relatively real. Now you gotta understand, my father has known me for years. He knows rum dumb, as he calls me. <laughs> Okay. And uh, all he's doing each day is getting up, shuffling, sitting, shitting, showering, dressing, eating, sleeping. Me, my mind's creating all these trips, you see. And it takes me a couple of weeks before I realize that I'm never with my father. I'm always in my mind about my father. I'm always back one thought away from where he is. So he's just sitting there waiting or sitting, shitting, showering, shaving. I mean, he's just doing his thing. He's like a tree. He's just being the Buddha. And I'm busy, you know, creating scenarios. I'm writing movie scripts all the time. And it takes me weeks before I see that when I was in Burma and doing spiritual practices, 
I got through the place of creating scenarios, but the minute I came back into the world, quote, into the world, it seemed somehow like legitimizing these scenarios. And the minute I treated back in the world as more of my practice, I started to quiet down until pretty soon there was just lifting, pushing, moving, showering, drying, combing, shuffling. I was just doing the acts each day and suddenly dad and I were in the same space together. I mean, in the space of love together. There was no space between us. And we'd be shuffling to the kitchen and I'd say to him, you content dad? He'd say, very. I'd say, me too. And we would just be luxuriating in this space of presence together. And all of the stuff that was going on was just stuff. We just happened to meet on this plane to walk on the walker into the kitchen. But that was just the vehicle. That wasn't the essence. My brother said to me, really great the way you take care of dad, which means he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> see? see, and I milk it. See, I a little, because uh, you know, my ego, I say, well, somebody's got to do it. I'm not going to tell him. It's like the highest thing I do all day. But the minute that transfers so that no longer did I see, I don't have to go to Rangoon, Burma to sit. I can take this act itself and make it my, my yoga, my way. I, I take that one step further. Last year, I did uh, 15 cities or 12 cities on my tour. And what I felt was the tour is so toxic because you're sitting in the presence of, of people, um, you know, loving you. And then you get airplanes and you get stewardesses and delays and baggage. And there's lots of ways to get stuck. So every morning I would meditate sort of to get ready to get lost, if you can hear that. And then I thought, why am I so sloppy? Why can't it all be my sadhana? Why am I using one method to protect me from something else? Why don't I make all of my life my method? So this year, I mean, I'm, I, it's hard for me as a practicing spiritual person to admit this. I'm not even meditating anymore. I just get on airplanes, get off. And who do I meet? And who am I? And what is this? This is my yoga right now. You are my work on myself. If I'm not sitting inside, just sitting here, if I get caught in this drama, then I'll find my beads and they'll bring me back. See, the level of nothing's happening. This is all empty. This is all empty forms. And at the same moment, it's so preciously sweet and graceful. And your mind keeps going in and out. Hold on tightly, let go lightly. You just keep floating like, a, like one of those flowers that keeps opening and closing. And you get so that the way you drive, the way you meet the person at the ticket counter, it all becomes the stuff. Who do you meet anyway? There's a beautiful poem of um, Thich Nhat Hanh. He said, I, uh, this is part of his poem. He said, I am the mayfly metamorphizing on the surface of the river. I am also the bird which when spring comes arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond. I am also a grass snake who approaching in silence feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. I am also the merchant of arms selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. I am also the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills up all the four oceans. 
please call me by my correct names so that I can hear at the same time all of my cries and all of my laughs so that I could see that my joy and pain are but one. Please call me by my correct names so that I could become awake so that the door of my heart be left open, the door of compassion. Kabir's poem. Since the day when I met with my Lord, there has been no end to the sport of our love. I see with eyes open and smile, and behold his beauty everywhere. I utter his name, and whatever I see, it reminds me of him. Whatever I do, it becomes his worship. Wherever I go, I move round him. All I achieve is his service. When I lie down, I lie prostrate at his feet. Whether I rise or sit down, I can never forget him, for the rhythm of his music beats in my ears. When you really look for me, you will see me instantly. You will find me in the tiniest house of time, Kabir says. What is the beloved? It is the breath inside the breath. That professor may have thought nothing happened to me, but what's happened to me is that I've fallen in love. And it's, it has been very confusing. It has been very confusing to start to see the beloved because you don't know what to do about it. You walk down the street and you look at somebody and they are so beautiful. You can't bear it. And there's nothing to do about it. And we're so used to when we feel that intensity of love, trying to possess it because we've been so starved for it for so long. We want to bring them home and take care of them and nurture them and collect them. And you get so that you are so, it is so sweet to be in the world when you have stopped being afraid of all the faces of your beloved. When you can look at the horrible ones or the ones that would usually close your heart and still keep your heart open. And this is an exercise. This is the stuff I do all day. I kid about it because I do one little exercise that's kind of funny. I've had a hard time with Casper Weinberger. I mean, I mean, he's a good man. It's just that he's wrong. And um, <laughs> so there are part, I, I have a hard time with him. So I have this little puja table with holy pictures on it. And I have, you know, Buddha and Christ and Mar Mary and Anand my Ma and my guru. And I have Casper Weinberger. And I light my candles and incense. Good morning, Buddha. Good morning, Christ. Good morning, Maharaji. Good morning, Ananda Maima. Hello, Casper. <laughs> and I see that's where I am yet. That's where I am yet. Because I can disagree with Casper. I can oppose him. I may lay down my life in opposition to him. It may turn out. Who knows? But if I put him out of my heart... I keep him entrapped in being Casper. I keep him entrapped in his own separateness, and he's frightened, and it's out of his fear that comes his political decisions. It's like, I want to protest against the proliferation of the bomb. But if, and I've had this long dialogue with Dan Ellsberg about this, because if I protest motivated by fear and urgency, all I do by my every action is feed into the system fear. And fear is the root cause of the bomb in the first place. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to get rid of a symptom and feeding the cause. Finally, we work on ourselves as the gift we offer to the world around us. 
And where you don't see the beloved is where your work is. Every time somebody catches me in reactivity, ah, you got me. See, it's far out. As long as you want to be high, everything that brings you down, you push away. When you want to be free, everything that brings you down is a, a message to you. It's a gift to you showing you where your secret stash of clinging mind is. And you don't ask for it, but when it comes down, you really work with it. Come on, baby. The other night I was in St. Louis. I'm really done. We're going to meditate on that. I, I was in St. Louis. Uh, Des Moines, I'm sorry. I'm always somewhere. Um, it doesn't matter, see. Uh, I was in Des Moines, and I walked into the hall. And since I don't know who I am, and I don't care, I'm like a rent around us. I mean, what difference does it make? You know, it's like, and when you don't, when you're not busy being somebody, you experience the projections of other people coming and they keep turning you into what they see you as because you don't care. You're not having to be somebody against their projection. So when somebody walks in and says, Ramdas, I go, yes. You know, it's like you can feel yourself just kind of falling into the role, you know. And so I'll be Ramdas, sure. I mean, I see people say, well, I, that that's only dishonest if you're being somebody else underneath. But I'm not. I'm not. There's no form to me. So I can just move into forms. If you say, hi, Dick, I'll say, hi. If you say, Ramdas, I'll say, yes. You know, it's like, <laughs> see? So I came into the hall, and there were all these people saying, Ramdas, hi, Ramdas, hi. And I was being Ramdasi, you know, yes, yes. And gentle, humble, you know, wise, simple. There's a whole routine you do as Ramdas, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not dishonest. You've got to understand because there's nobody behind it. It doesn't matter. It's all form. And if you buy the form, that's your problem, not mine. I'm just what you projected. I don't care. See, this is a tough world. It's far more far. It's much farther out than most people will buy. They want everybody to be as they appear to be. I love it when they're not. So I walked in, and every evening I ask for this microphone with a mini boom so I can sit cross-legged, because if it's straight, Mike, you got to lean like this all night. So I walked in the hall, and I was being so loving and sweet, and I looked up, and there was a straight microphone. I said, what's that? <laughs> and the woman said, that was the manager, she said, well, that's the only microphone we had available. And I, well, we ordered this, and I wrote, and I, and I heard myself turn into this, you know, and I absolutely broke up. I broke up laughing. Because I saw that my guru had come as a microphone to say, think you're so holy, huh? You think you're so free. Try this one on, baby. Yeah. The, other, the other day, I, was, I do radio interviews by telephone every day in the mornings for the gigs um, that are down the road, you know. So about a week ago, I was doing Denver, which I appeared at last night. I was doing a radio show, and the guy was a very hip interviewer. And he started out, and he got me so on the defensive. He was brilliant. And he took a telephone call, and the guy said, I think you're one of the, you and Shirley MacLaine are the worst things that are happening to society. And he started in, and, and I was doing my best. I was doing my beads extra fast, you know, and I was <laughs> doing my best. And finally, I, I said, I don't need to talk to you. <laughs> and Jai, who's my partner in this whole industry, he just broke up in the other room. I mean, we, he heard me get caught. And we just love it when we get caught. Because that's the, that's the way you're going to get free if somebody shows you where you're, where you're getting caught. I mean, if everybody just keeps you asleep in the game, that's no fun. Like Stephen Levine, who writes books, he's a beautiful guy and a friend of mine. I'll call Stephen, and Stephen will talk to me for a minute, and then he'll say, how's your heart, Ramdas? First time he did it, I said, my heart's fine. What are you asking for? <laughs> and we both heard it. That's what friends are for, to tell you when your heart closes down. Just what's on your plate that's your vehicle to liberation. If you're turning away from anything, it's got you. 
as you cultivate the emptiness and start to feel safe in the formless, you will be able to dive more deeply into the form. Most people are afraid of the form that are on the spiritual journey for fear they'll get lost in it. When you really want truth and want freedom, you have, you'd have no fear. You'll go under for a moment, but you'll come up. A lot of people say to me, I was doing so well and then I fell off the path. That's nonsense. There's no way to fall off the path. It's just that you got phony holy too soon. But even that wasn't an error. There are no errors in the game. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that it's all unfolding as it must and each person is growing as they need to? This, of course, it helps if you have a reincarnational view. Because when you look at a single life, sometimes it seems pretty crummy. But when you stand back far enough, you just see the karma unfolding step by step. And then you understand how life is a dance, how it's a play, how it's a game. And that doesn't trivialize it. You have a sense of the preciousness of each moment, and yet how empty it is. You're no longer trying to milk it for experience. Because just dying into the moment, the moment is so full. It's so thick and full. It's enough. I have a hard time remembering yesterday. I thought at first I was brain damaged from too many drugs. <laughs> but now I see that this moment is so rich with all of it in every direction. All of it. For years, I collected boxes of memorabilia. You know, things you can't bear to be parted from. With the idea that someday... I would look through them. I never did, you understand. I just keep closing them and labeling them. Letters, old love letters, pictures of people you'll never see again, slides of Grand Canyon, you know, important documents from the 60s, stuff like that. At some point I thought, isn't this funny? I'm saving these as if I'm going to run out of the present. Because the present for the past 10 years has been so thick, I haven't had time to open the boxes. Why do I assume I'm going to run out of it later? So I decided to get rid of all the boxes. So I threw them out. But in the middle of the night, I was out in the garbage dump. <laughs> <laughs> Not just yet, baby. Because <laughs> we keep grandstanding. So you, you intellectually see where you're going to be spiritually later, and you try to imitate it. And that's just more trippy. Then you see that you just caught yourself again in your own front. You've got to move at the rate you've got to go and you've got to appreciate. What flips over is that the judging mind surrenders into the appreciative mind. You go out in the woods and you look at pines and oaks and elms and you say, oh, look, you don't say that pine would be better for an elm. <laughs> but the minute you get near humans, especially yourself, notice that appreciation gives way to the judging. It'd be much better if I were more like Gandhi. Until you're just appreciating the beloved in all of its many forms. That's the form of it. And the emptiness is just the vastness that lies just beyond the forms, just behind the billboard, as Rilke says. <laughs> where the mind is so empty and so quiet and so pure. Dwell nowhere and bring forth that mind. Nowhere is the zero of purest experience known inwardly as fundamental peace and rest. To come forth is to stand firmly and contain the myriad things. You are emptiness containing all things. When mind gazes into mind itself, the train of discursive and conceptual thought ends and supreme enlightenment is gained. Finally, he who clings to the void and neglects compassion does not reach the highest stage. 
But he who practices only compassion does not gain release from the toils of existence. He, however, who is strong in practice of both remains neither in samsara nor nibbana, neither in form or formless. Are we ready? Are we ready to be fully us? Isn't it a fascinating challenge? Isn't it extraordinary? Doesn't it make the life experience such an incredible opportunity to awaken to the fullness of our being? <sighs> this podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.